Good morning, everyone. Today we celebrate two great giants of the church, St. Peter and St. Paul. So I greet you this lovely morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace and peace of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now let us prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries by calling to mind our sins. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, Heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, Only Begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who on the solemnity of the Apostles Peter and Paul give us the noble and holy joy of this day, grant, we pray, that your Church may in all things follow the teaching of those through whom she received the beginnings of right religion. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. The first reading is from the book of Acts. King Herod started persecuting certain members of the church. He beheaded James, the brother of John, and when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he decided to arrest Peter as well. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and he put Peter in prison, assigning four squads of four soldiers each to guard him in turns. Herod meant to try Peter in public after the end of the Passover week. All the time Peter was under guard, the church prayed to God for him unremittingly. On the night before Herod was to try him, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, fastened with double chains, while guards kept watch at the main entrance to the prison. Then suddenly the angel of the Lord stood there, and the cell was filled with light. He tapped Peter on the side and woke him. Get up, he said, hurry, and the chains fell from his hands. The angel then said, put on your belt and sandals. After he had done this, the angel next said, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Peter followed him, but had no idea what the angel did was all happening in reality. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed through two guard posts, one after the other, and reached the iron gate leading to the city. This opened of its own accord. They went through it and walked the whole length of one street when suddenly the angel left him. It was only then that Peter came to himself. Now I know it is all true, he said. The Lord really did send his angel and saved me from Herod and from all that the Jewish people were so certain would happen to me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The angel of the Lord rescues those who revere him. 
I will bless the Lord at all times, his praise always on my lips. In the Lord my soul shall make its boast, the humble shall hear and be glad. The angel of the Lord rescues those who revere him. Glorify the Lord with me. Together let us praise his name. I sought the Lord and he answered me. From all my terrors he set me free. The angel of the Lord rescues those who revere him. Look towards him and be radiant. Let your faces not be ashed. This poor man called. The Lord heard him and rescued him from all his distress. The angel of the Lord rescues those who revere him. The angel of the Lord is encamped around those who revere him to rescue them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is happy who seeks refuge in him. The angel of the Lord rescues those who revere him. The second reading is from the letter of Paul to Timothy. My life is already being poured away as a libation, and the time has come for me to be gone. I have fought the good fight to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. All there is to come now is the crown of righteousness reserved for me, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day when not only to me, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. The Lord stood by me and gave me power, so that through me the whole message might be proclaimed for all the pagans to hear. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from all evil attempts on me and bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he put this question to his disciples. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say he is John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he said, who do you say I am? Then Peter spoke up. You are the Christ, he said, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Simon, son of Jonah, you are a happy man, because it was not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So I now say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the underworld can never hold out against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be considered bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be considered loosed in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. It's an old story, but it seems to fit, so please forgive me if you've heard it before. Waking up one morning, a priest in a small town found a dead jackass on his front lawn. So he called the fire station. He called the police station. He even called the roadworks. And then he called the national health. But nobody would come out and remove the dead animal. Finally, he called the mayor who was a well-known atheist. Well, Father, the mayor said snidely, I always thought it was the duty of the clergy to bury the dead. That is true, Mr. Mayor, the priest replied, but it's also our first duty to notify the next of kin. <laughs> 
We laugh, but atheists and agnostics abound in our present-day society. Science is the new religion where psychologists tell us that Christianity is only an outdated emotional crutch. Television personalities preside over a new marketplace liturgy, while huge stadiums have become the new cathedrals where fans shout their prayers to the latest array of gods paraded before us. The media has taken over the role of confessor for the people, and New Age philosophy has replaced the traditional system of moral values. Paganism and skepticism has grown to such proportions that it has now taken on a violent twist. Just look at the news this past week. Violent riots and looting are happening in the large cities, while the jackass mayors smile benignly and excuse the carnage as happy block parties and love fests. These mayors have abandoned their prime responsibility of protecting the residents and property in their cities and are actually allowing the mob to tear down historic statues and monuments that run counter to the latest emotional ideology. Books and paintings have been burned. Even gravestones are not exempt from the emotional fury of the mob. What has been more interesting to note is not what was targeted, but what was not targeted by these violent mobs. While many Christian and Jewish gravestones have been smashed, the tomb of Karl Marx in Highgate Cemetery, North London, has been totally ignored. Statues like those of Winston Churchill and many of the American presidents were attacked and vandalized, but statues of Lenin have been reverentially spared. Makes you wonder. The last time this sort of mob violence happened saw the rise to power of Lenin and Stalin and a form of socialism that became the communism of Marx. A system that resulted in the deaths of over 100 million people worldwide and still does today in places like China. A few years later, Adolf Hitler harnessed the mob to rise to power in Europe. Starting out as a member of the Socialist German Workers' Party, he took it over and made it into the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazis for short. Again, this resulted in the deaths of millions of people. These evil people inflamed raw emotion and used it to control and direct mob violence and consolidate their power. The question every reasonable thinking person needs to ask themselves today is this. Who is behind all of this violence? And more importantly, will they be brought to justice? In the meantime, elderly and vulnerable residents are terrorized by roaming gangs and instead of responding, the police prioritize their resources to tracking down and prosecuting Twitter and Facebook comments that might have hurt somebody's feelings. And just like the mobs controlled by Lenin, Stalin and Hitler, the vandals have now turned their attention to the church. So stained glass windows portraying a white Jesus and Mary are now fair game for the vandals, as are the statues of Mary and the saints. To object to this sort of mindless anarchy only results in accusations of racism and bigotry, whatever those terms seem to mean to the mind of the mob. So where do you stand on these issues today? Are you with the godless anarchists who want to tear everything down? Or perhaps this is all too much for you and all you want to do is bury your head in the sand and hope it all goes away. 
Or perhaps you are hoping that these people will have a conversion and come to their senses. Perhaps a conversion like that of Paul. Well, since today is the celebration of Saints Peter and Paul, let's talk about some lives that really matter for a change, shall we? Besides, there are some parallels to the time in which they lived which are of more than passing interest to the times in which we live now. Take Paul. Paul did, not, uh, Paul did start out in a violent way, if you remember. The darkest blot on his record came prior to his Christian discipleship. The book of Acts openly tells the story and Paul himself confesses it in some of his own writings. In a nutshell, he was a persecutor of the early church. A zealous and faithful Pharisee, he had men and women arrested and imprisoned and even condemned to death for no other reason than being followers of Christ. Perhaps Paul never actually committed murder himself, but he was certainly an accomplice. Remember, he was the young man who held the coats of the mob who stoned St. Stephen to death in the year 36 AD. But then there was that little encounter with Jesus on the way to Damascus that changed everything. He saw that his whole life had been going in the wrong direction and it turned his world upside down. And that got him into trouble. It started right after his conversion. When he tried to join the church, he was given the cold shoulder treatment. The Christians didn't trust him and wouldn't have anything to do with him. For most people, that would have been a reason enough to give up and quit, but not Paul. After he'd gained acceptance in the church, things didn't get any easier. On his first missionary journey, he was stoned and left for dead. On his second journey, he was beaten and thrown into prison. His third journey ended with a riot in Jerusalem. And Paul might have been killed, but for the intervention of Roman soldiers, the cops of his day. This chapter of the story ends with Paul in prison. And as far as we know, he never saw another day of freedom afterwards. But he was a truly happy man for all of that. How different to the screaming mobs we see gleefully reported on the evening news. Paul had a hard life, and most of the hardship was related to his Christian commitment. He had every excuse in the world to throw in the towel. Most people would have given up and gone home, but not Paul. Years later, as his life was winding down, he was able to say, I have run the race to the finish. Notice, he doesn't say, I won the race. He doesn't claim to have run faster or better than anyone else. He simply says, I finished. And in the race of life, that is the real challenge. In that sentence, it's that sentence that makes Paul's story memorable. If he'd packed it in when the going got tough, his name would have been long since forgotten. For a life to be worthy of remembering or imitation, it must be lived to the finish. So what is the secret of that kind of life? Well, two things, I think. One is faith. Paul was a strong man with an iron will, but he was under no illusions about the source of his strength. It wasn't his iron will. It wasn't his personal determination. In this same reading, he tells us what it was. He said, the Lord stood by me and gave me power. And that's what enabled Paul to say, I have run the race to the finish. Of course, he had help. And that same help is available to us all. It does not make life easy but it is certainly less lonely to realize that we are not running this race by ourselves. 
You know, the ones participating in all the violence must lead terribly lonely lives. All they have is a political cause to comfort them. They have no God or faith in their lives. The other part of Paul's secret was patience. He knew how to wait. And the person who does not know how to do that is ill-suited for living in this world. This is a place where all the best things take time. We know you can microwave a frozen dinner in five minutes or less, but a gourmet meal takes hours to prepare. For a hundred quid, you can get a mail-order degree in about 30 days, but a real education will take thousands of hours and cost thousands of pounds. Before I became a priest, I was a commercial pilot. It took a long time and there were several examinations and a lot of hard work to qualify for my license. I built up a lot of flying hours and with it a lot of valuable experience. But sometimes taking a deliberate shortcut can have tragic consequences. Last month, an Airbus A320 crashed in Pakistan, killing 98 people. According to initial official reports, the pilots were preoccupied by the coronavirus crisis and tried to land the aircraft with the wheels still up. But this past week, some more chilling news emerged. It appears that more than 30% of civilian pilots in Pakistan have faked licenses and they're not even qualified to fly. Pakistan's aviation minister revealed that 262 airline pilots in the country did not take the exam themselves but had paid someone else to sit it on their behalf. They don't have flying experience, he said. Pakistan has 860 active pilots serving its domestic airlines, including the country's Pakistan International Airlines flagship. These pilots, the minister said, tried to shortcut the process and people died. I suspect a lot of them will be going to prison because they tried to take the easy route. Our second reading today was written from a Roman prison. Paul, a man of dignity and honour, was in jail. All the while, a pathetic little clown named Nero was seated on the throne. It was a gross injustice. But the day would come when that situation was reversed. Parents with pride would start naming their baby boys Paul and those same parents with great contempt would call their dogs Nero. <laughs> well, that day did not come for quite a long time, but it did come. As God lives, that day will always come. So this is a lesson for all of those who would terrorize people and loot, burn and vandalize public and private property. There will be an accounting. As for Peter, as far as we know, Peter was not a notorious sinner prior to his friendship with Jesus. He was just an ordinary family man who plied his trade as a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee. The scriptures tell us that he had a mother-in-law, but they don't tell us how many children he had. They do tell us that it was his brother Andrew who first brought him to the attention of Jesus. And we don't have to do too much reading between the lines to deduce that he was a rough-talking, impetuous, and probably quick-tempered fellow. But you know, none of those traits seriously indicts a man. The real blight on Peter's record came the night before Jesus was crucified. We all remember it well. In fact, how could anyone ever forget it? Three times Peter denied any association with Jesus or even any knowledge of him. His reason for doing that was quite clear. It was to save his own skin. So in just a matter of a few hours, Peter proved himself to be a coward, a liar and a traitor. Hmm. 
Just like Paul, Peter had a past of which he was always ashamed. Peter and Paul remind us that giants of the faith are far from perfect. And even after they become serious followers of Christ, even that. I think we often tend to forget that. Our inclination is more to put the saints up on a pedestal and think of them as something other than human. But the writers of the New Testament were much more realistic than that. The writers simply told the story of the church and let the chips fall where they would. When one of the great leaders faltered and failed, the writers didn't try to disguise it. Our church history does not hide that reality. Then later when Peter lapsed into racial discrimination, no cover-up was allowed. You can read all about it in Paul's letter to the Galatians, and I hope you will, because it's one of Paul's finest. You know, we need to get rid of the notion that the great leaders and saints of the church were somehow superhuman. History shows that such was not the case. Peter and Paul were ordinary people, just like we are. They made mistakes, just like we do. But they got up and kept on going, just like we should. I suppose if there is a real difference between them and us is the degree of their devotion to Christ. They made a serious commitment to their Lord and follow it all the way to the end. What Paul said about himself was, no doubt also true of Peter, I have fought the good fight to the end. I have run the race to the finish. I have kept the faith. I could wish that someday you and I may be able to make those words our own. Jackass mayors and politicians will come and they go. Their pompous speeches are forgotten before the echoes die away. No one names their children after a politician, but the names and deeds of Peter and Paul will endure forever. And that's the way it is. God bless you. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now let us pray to Christ who built his church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Simon the fisherman was called by you to be a fisher of men. Call others today to share in his task. Lord, hear us. <clears throat> when the disciples feared that the ship was sinking, you commanded the sea and there was calm. Protect your church in the midst of trouble and give her the peace that the world cannot give. Lord, hear us. After your resurrection, you gathered your church around Peter. 
Gather all your people now into the unity for which you prayed. Lord, hear us. You sent Paul as an apostle to all men. Let your good news be preached today through all creation. Lord, hear us. You entrusted the keys of your kingdom to your church. Open the gates of life to the dead who put their trust in you. Lord, hear us. And now let us pause to add our own needs and prayers to those of the entire church. Lord, hear us. Mary trusted in God her Saviour, so now we have the courage to pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Be God forever. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept this sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. May the prayer of the apostles, O Lord, accompany the sacrificial gift that we present to, by your, to your name for consecration. And may their intercession make us devoted to you in celebration of the sacrifice through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For by your providence, the blessed apostles Peter and Paul bring us joy. Peter, foremost in confessing the faith. Paul, its outstanding preacher. Peter, who established the early church from the remnant of Israel. Paul, master and teacher of the Gentiles that you call. And so each in a different way gathered together the one family of Christ and revered together throughout the world, they share one martyr's crown. Therefore, with all the angels and saints, we praise you, as without end we acclaim. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In 
In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Ralph, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours for ever and ever. Amen. And now at the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we now dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign for ever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Now let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, 
but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, who have been renewed by this sacrament, so to live in the church, that persevering in the breaking of the bread and in the teaching of the apostles, we may be one heart and one soul, made steadfast in your love. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Mass is ended. Go in peace.